Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. Uh, Nick Hanna here. We got Chad Alderson in the room and, and one of my good buddies and uh, entomologist from Chico State, Joe Sluzark. Joe, how you doing, man? Good, good. Welcome thanks, back, thanks, Joe. Yeah, thanks for coming back on the show. Sure. What was the last one he was on? Sex? Or, well, yeah, sex. How, what, how did we say it? Sex? Bugs and rock and roll. Was it sex? No, hugs we didn't do it. That wasn't him. That he was no, a, it was, was a long he, time. It was a hexagenous episode we did with Hal Jansen. Oh he was yeah, here. yeah, that's right. It that's wasn't right. sex. It was hex, hex bugs, bro. and right. rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't listened to that episode and you want to listen to uh, and learn all about um, hexagenous mayflies, go check that one. That's out. right. I forgot. This. And then yeah. b- before that, we were here talking about mayflies and stoneflies, and we kind of yeah. we never got to caddis. So that's what we're, our main yeah. goal is today: is to talk talk yeah. about caddis, but. Chad, you had a story or something. Yeah, that so you like wanted to sh- you before wanted to we share. before we go into the the, the caddis, um, so we we got a Facebook message today from a guy, and he's like, "Hey, what happened in the episode you guys were going to do on on the water in McLeod with with John Rickard from from Wild Waters Fly Fishing?" And we had we talked about doing this one like a couple, I think probably twice on the on the show so far. Well, we did. When I say we, it was me. I made an attempt <laughs> to go down there and do it. Um, I packed in all the uh, audio equipment to make this happen. We we hiked down almost to the rope. Um, if you guys know where the guy, guys that have, have fished that section know where I'm talking about. So it was kind of a long hike. Got down there, got all set up for lunch, and found a nice flat rock with John and a buddy of mine. And um, broke out all the equipment, mic'd everybody up, and then went to hit play and realized I didn't bring any SD cards. So, um, needless to say, I felt like a dick and good thing um, that equipment's pretty light, we, right? So packed it all back out and we're, uh, <laughs> we're in the process of trying to get, trying to get John, uh, actually in studio. Um, we told him we'll take him striper fishing. So hopefully that's a big enough carrot to entice him to come down the hill from Shasta and sit with us. And we'll talk all about McLeod and all the other stuff that those guys, um, fish. All right. <sighs> Anyway, <laughs> back to you, Nick. We digress, but we get back. We get yeah, back to it. Yeah, yeah. Why isn't it to me? It's us. We're all here. Because <laughs> you're hosting <laughs> this one, baby. So, Caddis, Joe, real quick, name them all as fast as you can. Ready, go. <laughs> There's way too many. You don't have them like in a some, some sort of a rhyme to remember uh, them? No. <laughs> Um, the main yeah. ones that I, th- I hydropsyche are probably the most popular that I that I think of when I you know what's neat I I did a snorkel survey recently I think it's the second time I bring this up but as I was swimming around I definitely turned rocks and looked I was looking at bugs more than I was sometimes the fish because there's not there's way more bugs than there are fish down oh, there yeah. right um, and it was pretty cool to to be able to lift a rock and turn it upside down and and recognize all these different species you know I'm not there yet. Um, so let, maybe let's talk about that. Like, how how do we identify what what a caddis caddis looks like? Well, um, basically, the adults uh, they're very closely related to moths. Yes. So they look a lot like a moth. Hmm. Um, or or caterpillar. Yeah. Right. Well, the the larvae yeah yep. do look caterpillar like, and both both orders they both uh, spin silk. You know, so they both make a silk cocoon that they pupate in. Um, the big difference between, uh, you know, a moth and a butterfly versus a caddisfly is that the, uh, there's, on a moth wing or a butterfly wing, there are scales. That's what all that color is on mm. the bright, showy butterflies. Oh, are, it's, it's are, like refracting all the, well, the spectrum of light? A, well, no, they're actually, yeah, they do reflect the spectrum of light, but they actually I almost think of them like... Um, like a big palmate feather or something like that. They have pigment, and you can scrape those off. Oh, wow. They'll okay. come off. Now, the difference, the, the caddis flies or the trichoptera, in place of those scales, they have little hairs, and the hairs are all hydrophobic, which means that they repel water. That's why you, when you see caddis flies, if you ever see a caddis fly like emerge, they pop up out of the water and they just can bounce around on top because they're basically waterproof. <laughs> they're like Teflon. And, and, you know, a lot of them actually go, the adults, females come back to lay their eggs in the stream. Some fly and dip their eggs on the surface, but oh. there are some that land and crawl down on rocks. 
and there's some that just dive into the water and swim to the bottom. And the, because they have all those hairs outside on the outside of their body, it forms a little bubble over the adult. So they basically take a, a bubble of oxygen or atmospheric air so they can breathe on their way down. What? And they'll swim all the way down to the bottom. They'll lay their eggs. And depending upon the group, some pop back up and the females will come back later. But you can imagine a lot of them die down there because, you know, they they get knocked around in rocks and stuff yeah. like that. They eventually use up the oxygen and in that little bubble and stuff like that. And um, people always talk about, you know, the old classic wet flies mm -hmm. that people used to swing mm -hmm. and every and when i was a kid there was like it was all about the dry fly and matching the hatch and right i used to read stuff in fly fishing magazines about how the old wet flies are nothing but lures and they don't imitate anything <laughs> <laughs> we'll go look at some of those old classic wet flies and they're tied with shiny material on the body mm -hmm. like a shiny ribbing they're all made to imitate caddis flies. Yeah, huh. uh, that makes a lot and of sense. I mean, you even swing them through the current, you know? So when, they, when they're laying eggs on that, that's overpositing, right? Is that yes. what you call it? Yeah. Overpositing, and then the other ones are, um, basically there's two types, the ones that will lay the eggs and the other ones that will dive down. Well, they'll Is that underpositing? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're both laying eggs. They uh -huh. just do it a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, the hydropsyche, which are real common out in uh, the valley rivers here, mm. is hydropsyche californica is real common. And they do dive into the water, and the adults do to swim down. So if you think about it, you have actually the fish out on the, like the sack or the feather or you, but even... You need to imitate like all three life stages, you know, the larvae, the pupae, and the diving adults. <laughs> um, Gary LaFontaine had a bunch of, uh, you know, new wet fly patterns that he designed using Antron, like in the 80s. Mm -hmm. and, Antron's uh, that ma the material for yeah. tying flies, yeah. And they're, they're, they're made out of Antron. They, they, so they catch air bubbles. And uh, you know, but they're tied to they're tied to imitate an adult, and he used to he would like swing those either right in the surface or right under the surface, or even cast like an like an old cast of three flies, and you're swinging them down and across and twitching them right on top. And I've done all three things on the feather, and they'll catch fish. Every single mm -hmm. one of those systems, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, or you can also drop a a pupa with a bead head and put one of those up above it and swing them, you know? Uh, when, um, do they, so some of them drop eggs on the top, some dive down and drop eggs. Does that, do they do only do that within their subspecies? Am I even saying the subspecies right in this context? Yeah, it's species specific. It is. Okay. That was, yeah. my, that was my question too. And I, I don't have a really good idea of like how broadly one or the other is. Um, I know like the hydropsyche do it. I know that the brachycentrist do it, which is the Mother's Day caddis, or what we down around here we call that the spring caddis. Um, those that's back east was what was called the classic name for it was the granums. Are those a really little dark green or bright yeah, green ones? Yep, and they're the ones that come off in the spring. If you ever, if you ever pick up their cases, their cases are some one species. They're square. That's Amer. Uh, yeah, I think that's Americanus, and the other one they're round, but they're made out of little sticks. Mm -hmm. They almost look like little log cabins. Mm -hmm. Um. Those, so those are the springtime caddis, typically? Well, yeah, that would be the spring caddis. That's the brachycentris out here. We have Occidentalis and Americanus. Occidentalis is... I'm trying to remember. One comes off in one big group. 
and I can't remember which species it is, if it's Occidentalis or Americanus, but that will be, like you'll see the spring caddis. Um, if you go to Big Chico Creek early in the in the spring, you'll catch lots and lots of big larvae and even fine pupa. Um, the other species comes off, Americanus comes off in little drips and drabs, um, like from the spring all the way through the summer. Hmm. Um, back east, where I grew up, there's a bunch of species, but they all kind of come off really close together in April and May. I've hmm. I've fished, you know, like granum type wet flies on spring creeks in central Pennsylvania, and I've had forty fish days. That's the only time you ever get catch fish like that back east, or at least me. I didn't. <laughs> you know. Um, well, I think anybody would argue that like the caddis is king, right? I mean, if if you're fishing any river, I don't know care where you're at. I feel like caddis should be in your box at at all times. Well, yeah, or you should have you should have an attractor pattern or something like that that like passes for a caddis. Mm-hmm. What would you say those I mean, are? Oh, my Nick knows what my favorite pattern is. My favorite pattern is a olive bird's nest. Mm-hmm. That's, Cause I, it, cause I it looks, fish that all the time. Or tan. Yeah, because it looks like so many things. Dude, it's it's great. It really I mean, does. It like can imitate a, a mayfly in size sixteen. Yeah, uh, you know, and then it starts getting as you get bigger. Obviously, the, it turns more into kind of a caddis pattern, mm-hmm. and it does a good job of capturing like that bubble yeah. that well, you're talking did about. Did you ever put it in the shaker? Yeah, shaker. Yeah, we've talked about this. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then you get that that gives that puts a nice bubble on it. You guys are talking about basically put coating it with the dry fly float and then mm-hmm. then start, yeah. and then start doing it as a nymph right? yeah, yeah yeah as soon as you drop that fly that yeah. nymph under the water you can see you a see bubble, bubble. attached right to it Ooh. <laughs> and you know you guys writing that one down <laughs> and you know it's funny because um when i lived in colorado i really i started fishing a lot of soft hackles when i right before i left pennsylvania when i lived in colorado i was kind of an addict i used to do a lot of sight fishing with soft hackles and I used to tie like a lot of old classic patterns, like the March Brown spider and stuff like that. Only I'd put, only I'd wrap some like some extra uh, 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 copper copper wire underneath the body to let them sink a little bit. Mm. And you know, you drop them in, and you could see there was no floating on it. It was just all picked out hair's mask. Hmm. Because I was tying them a classic waist, a straight up hair's mask, pick it all out, you know, orange underbody ribbed with gold or copper wire, you know, and a partridge hackle. And the first couple times you drop that sucker in there, and I'd be sight fishing, and I realized it's like there's that little bubble, and then fish come fish over, come and, over eat and, it. and eat it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it it was like it makes me wonder, like. I don't remember how old that fly is, but it's hundreds of years old. It was invented in the UK a long, long time ago. And I'm convinced somebody somebody figured that out a long, long time ago and made that fly just hmm. because of that, because he used, he used what he had available. Hair's mask is really spiky and stuff like yeah. that. You have to use some You're wax. talking about a rabbit face? Yeah. Yeah, well, so like yeah, the hair's the ear hair's fly? Like we here's make, your pet. We yeah. make flies out of weird shit. <laughs> <laughs> some some rabbit just gets his face torn off for a fly. Well, <laughs> that sucks. But but remember when the fly was invented? Yeah, I know. That I'm was just, all they had. Yeah, that's yeah. what they were killing. If, their, that's yeah. what they were eating. Right. You know? If you if you look if you look at like really old <laughs> patterns, they got they're all made out of like pig's wool and <laughs> right. all, all kinds of strange stuff. That, you know, like what pig's wool? But <laughs> they had pigs. They ate them. They saved the wool. <laughs> made something out of it. You the, know, the, the horse foreskin popper. I heard that one fishes really well. So you have so you have a uh, these larvae. That are free. Some are just free float. They don't have their houses, right? They're actually just caterpillars that are down there underneath the rocks, right? They actually don't have homes, correct? Okay, there are. So I'm going to go back to this. I'm breaking yeah. it down, and then we're going to go into the flies here in a little bit. Okay, so there are caddis flies that build cases, and then there's caddis flies that don't build cases that are free living. Yep. Amongst the caddis flies that don't build cases. 
um, the Rye Coughlin never builds a case of any kind or a retreat or anything. Is that the carnivorous? One? Yeah, they're predatory. How do you know this shit? Um, I don't know. I he's, talked to, he's been talking to me just since he out. was in high school. Okay. okay. <laughs> 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 How old are you? Don't tell Nicole that, that I know that stuff either. Huh? Okay. <laughs> um, the the other fr- the other non case builders like the hydropsyche builds like a, a net so if you ever go out to the stream and like pick you'll pick up some rocks and you'll f- see all of this looks like silk mm-hmm. and it, like spider web or something yeah spider web or stuff that that's a hydropsyche uh, net and they set them up they face the current and like those um. I don't even know if you have them out here because I'm not really fluent in spiders. Back east, we have these spiders that live in hedges, and they'll build a web yeah. out along the hedge, and then it we, funnels in. Oh, oh funnel, I've seen it's the a funnel spider, isn't it? Is that, is I, that what it's I, I know what you're talking know. about. <laughs> I, I've so never it's, seen one here in California, but I know what you're talking about. You know about. what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, the the, the hydropsyche is kind of like that, too. They They sit back in there, and then every once in a while, they'll come out in their retreat. They they just go and they collect stuff, eat the stuff that's floated down and got what stuck they, in the net, and that's cotton, their exactly that is what insane. they caught in their net. And um, the mesh size uh, correlates directly with how high up in the watershed you are. That makes sense. Um, because when you're up high in the watershed, uh, the particulate organic matter, uh is basically that's floating there. It's broken down from leaves and stuff like that. It's going to be in bigger pieces. Mm-hmm. So they make they make nets with bigger sizes. And when you get down here in the valley, those nets are going to be really fine hmm. because the, por- the the little particles of organic matter are are broken down so much farther just from hmm. you know right. physically being beaten tumbled up. Yeah, to, yeah, to crap. Right, force, that's really cool. Force, that's a trip. Water. So they could they're it's kind of, it's kind of like their filter feeder, but they kind of build their own filter. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Well, well they're, they're they're they are actually they're 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 classed as filter feeders. Okay, you know, um, you know, because uh, amongst the caddis, there's uh, there's some that are predatory, there are some that are filter feeders. And then there's some that are grazers, and the grazers basically eat, like you know, when you pick up a rock and you feel that slime on top. Yeah, that's basically a layer of what we call paraphyton. So it's, you know, different kinds of algae mixed with like fungal hyphae, and there's like you know amoebas and bacteria yeah. and all kinds of stuff living in there, and and there's and even there's actually coronamids crawling around in there. So grazers or like cows they just kind of mow their way through the grass and they eat the you know cows eat grasshoppers and stuff like that all the time you know and that's what the grazers do huh and are those the ones that build their little casings around them those are typically the grazers because yeah. that's what i noticed i yeah. see when I'm, i was swimming down there i'd saw i'd see the uh, you know it's almost like a perfect ring that goes around right. the case Mm-hmm. So there, and it looks almost like, a, and when you pick it up, it's got a light bamboo type wood feel to it, you know. And then the other casings are typically like chunky sticks and pieces of rock, and mm-hmm. so completely different species, but both grazers. Right. Huh. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they they basically make a their house on their back, and then kind of they can move around. Yeah, yeah. The it affords some protection. It also um depending upon I don't know if this holds true for every case caddis fly but for a lot of them the case also also functions to um, enhance their respiration hmm. because the, um, the body is has taper li- is that what well, you're no, you, you have the the head, uh-huh. the thorax, where there's three sets of legs on the thorax and the abdomen. Mm-hmm. That abdomen has gills on it, even when they're inside that tube. And what happens is when they're, when they're walking along, they can go like this, 
and undulate their body up and down, and that can help them create a current going through inside the case through the case. Whoa. Um, stuff that lives in still water does that quite a bit because of the um, lack of oxygen. So yeah. they make these microcurrents around their body. Right, right. Because the hexes do the same thing when they're in their burrows. Mm. Oh, you know, that's okay. why they undulate like that to to bro- draw a current through there. Because they don't actively breathe, right? Like we do. Um, the oxygen and carbon dioxide for them just diffuses along, like a gradient. Like they're really weird to think about if you're only familiar with vertebrates. They have an exoskeleton, but their respiratory system is actually part of the exoskeleton that goes inside the body cavity and branches out into finer and finer. So it's like, it's imagine... Like, it's having like a your lung l- turned inside out. That's almost. what I was yeah. imagining, like your lung tissue being exposed out into the... Yeah, yeah. And then they just they depend solely on being in the right environment for the wow. oxygen to be able to pass through. And as they burn it up inside their body, they create a reverse gradient where the carbon dioxide moves out because they're... Hmm. Oxygen, carbon dioxide are trying to become equal. What a trip! I don't know if I explained that. No, Does yeah, that makes make sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but um, I don't want to be quizzed tomorrow. But yeah, <laughs> I think I got it. <laughs> so um, that that explains a lot on those different those those caddis, especially because I'm always seeing the larva ones and then the ones with the cases, yeah. and you get them all the way up to like the October caddis. Right, that are right. just gigantic, and yeah. that's what I was going to bring up too. Is um, you know I've seen them in like the McLeod and the Upper Sac, and and they're probably like an inch and a quarter, maybe an inch long. Yeah, they mm-hmm. get pretty big. And then I saw some like in our local creeks, and they were like two inches long, like massive, massive cases. What? Why? Well, why would that be? They might not be October caddis. There are some other really big caddis that actually emerge before the October caddis, but they don't come out in large numbers. Mm. That, that's one of those things where you're fishing and something goes by and you're like, oh, shit, what's that? <laughs> you know, and you just get a glimpse of it and you're like, that looks like a giant caddis fly. They're, they're in the same family um, and they're actually very pretty. October caddis? No, the, um, I'm tr- I can't remember. The larger the one. I can't remember the genus name of what I'm trying to think of now, but some of the, you know, the adults will be like that big. You know, psychoglyph is oh, a pretty common like three one. inches? Yeah, yeah. About as long as your pinky almost. It was massive. Yeah. It was the size right. of a, a stonefly, you know, yeah, like yeah, a big yeah. pteranarsis. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's they, what it, they, 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 yeah, those guys get that big. I'm, I'm drawing a complete blank on the genus that I'm trying to think of. I can see the wing <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Uh, but there's just some big boys in certain rivers. It yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah. And, but those really big ones, obviously, they can't be widely distributed, you know? Right. Um, oh, their ecosystem can only allow for so many. Yeah. So and, many. you know, when you're that big, they're going to be a big, strong flyers. And they probably go off and they, they mate and do everything out in the forest. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one thing a lot of people don't think about is like, you know, caddis and s- s- mayflies and stuff. Some of the stuff that can fly really well, they just go off into the forest. Like the longhorn caddis, caddis that emerge from the lakes. I've been up at Lake Davis in the evening, you know, as it's, it's, as it's getting dark and uh, me and my friend Jeff are getting ready to go out and fish, and you turn around and look, and here they come. I mean, millions of them. <laughs> um, both the black, the the dark black ones are mystacides. Um, I think Alephimbriata. I can't remember right now. And the other ones are Trionodes. I don't remember the name of the of the um, species, but you know that's the tan one and the black one, and they're they're in every lake in the Sierras, hmm. everywhere. Because they travel so far, they can they spread out quite a bit. Or that, that's their habitat. Yeah, you know. How do but, they? Um, oh, go ahead. You can finish that. If you- uh, but you know, they go out into the woods to mate and everything. Um, 
and then they come back in the evening to ovipause it in mass. So th the size of the fly will actually correlate to the distance that they take off? No. No, it's just no. depending on the species. It, yeah, it depends yeah. on the species. Gotcha. Mm. Um, you know, but they, you know, they get around. They don't just like fly, uh, you know, we collect, you can collect mayflies in traps like at the top of mountains and stuff like that that right. show up. Right. Mm. You know, um, how do those, do you know much about the October caddis? How, how do they differ than the, like the hydropsyche or the, or not the hydropsyche, but the other ones that are building their, their homes. It's just, it's strange to see them so prolific in some of these well, streams. They have, have a, they have a sequential emergence. So they emerge all together. Okay. So they, so you notice them. Okay. That's why but there's, there's different strategies to prevent yourself from being wiped to out prevent all every member of your population from being wiped out. One is to be sneaky and come off at night, you know. <laughs> one, one is to be like large and a very strong flyer, so that like when you do come off, you can get out, get away off into the forest where, like, say, you know, a dragonfly is not going to chase them very far because they're looking for target of Easy opportunity. Pickings, and yeah. you got this big caddisfly, and the dragonfly is not that much bigger than him, you know. Um, or you can like come all come off in a mass emergence and when there's just so many of you um you just overwhelm the predators so they take like the bait fish approach and school yeah. almost like school up in big big in, balls exa exactly it's the exact same thing or like okay. you know it's interesting birds never, do it. i've never birds, thought about yeah. that with insects or bugs and birds do, yeah birds do it you know yeah. like animals out on the serengeti it's just like you know um they're just coming off a lot in a, in a big group. and I mean, crowds do it, too. If you look at, like, you know, riots and things like that. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's just kind of, it's it's just like, in, it seems like a survival instinct just down in everything. Yeah, yeah. And it, that's because that's it's a good evolutionary strategy. Yeah. You know? Makes sense. But, I mean, even if you do get a predator that's very effective on feeding on you like a bird or something... He can only eat so many of you, and he can't eat yeah. any more. So, like, for example, with the October caddis, it's sitting in its case, and it's crawling around. It's it's eating like a cow. It's just munching on stuff on the rocks, you know, mm -hmm. as it's going. And um, over time, as it's getting closer to October, I know it's sometimes different than, than the month of October. I don't know what this the actual reason is for it to hatch. Maybe you do, but they're slowly building wings, right? In those cases, they're molting or changing into mm -hmm. to have wings on their case, and then they hatch and fly can you talk about well, well not, that they don't grow any wings or anything until they become a pupa what happens is the life stages are very well defined there's an egg there's a larval stage and i think in caddis i think it's four or five n stars it's it's set um then there's a pupa stage and then the adult stage and you know, like take the October caddis as an example. <coughs> It'll be living, it, it basically lives, does its stuff, eating and stuff like that, until it probably reaches a certain body mass that it's going to need. There's a concept called degree days, and it's a combination of temperature and the number of days at at certain temperatures at have temperature. to have to have to accumulate. Mm -hmm. Before, We've fla talked about yeah, this. Flowers, yeah. flowers have degree days. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's, you know, there's been some studies on it that you have to get a certain number of degree days. I also think that you also they have to get, they have to put on enough weight to be able to go through the transformation, and. You know, that's probably why, like, you know, big stone flies and stuff are take more more than one year. I was just going to say that, or like the hex fly. It, yeah, the, it hex, might the hex fly takes a couple of years. Deep, right. And I, and I wouldn't doubt that uh, dicosmonicus takes a couple of years. That's Do you it. think, I, I got two questions around degree days, and one, um, can you guys, like, accurate, accurately predict when there's a hatch that's going to be within a certain confidence interval? No. No, but one good way you can you could, you know, figure out like when something's gonna hatch is mm -hmm. much easier mm -hmm. is to basically 
when you see certain things hatching, start to look around to see what kind of flowers or plants are blooming. Because I think I talked to you, you guys about this yep, before. About we, you, brought, you asked the same question. Kelly. <laughs> Kelly. I did. Yeah. See, that's yeah. why I didn't want to be tested tomorrow. <laughs> but he, yeah. he answered in the same the way. New, listel, new listeners will benefit it, then. You know, it's but it's good to hear All because will be like, dude, it, you asked that question. It makes <laughs> it makes a lot of sense, you know. I did kinda, ask that? Yeah. Are yeah. you sure it wasn't um in a parallel universe or dimension? It could have been. I have weird things like that happen to um, me all the time. No, so. I kinda remember I do remember this this flower piece now. Right. But okay. Huh. So, you know. It, it it would probably be easier than trying to figure out the number of degree days and predict it right than to learn some of like uh the plants and like when i lived in denver mm-hmm. you don't even have to be anywhere near them i lived in denver and there was this there was i, I don't i think it was just some kind of decorative cherry tree but when that started blooming I knew that the the blooming olives would start hatching in the spring, up, Whoa. up on like an eleven mile che- eleven mile canyon, cheese mile Cheeseman Canyon, and uh, and uh, the Decker's area on the South Platte. Well, in the Western U.S., what what you know plants or trees should people know when they're going to hatch? He's talked about the uh, poppies. Coming out. Yeah, California poppies and, here in Chico. And then the hydropsyche being active on the Feather River. Yeah. But asking me about plants in California. Which <laughs> ones do you pay attention to? <laughs> the poppies. Um I don't I don't have as good a feel for California like as I did back east. Well talk about your region then that you're your com- that, that you know. Well because I'm just curious because you know, we can figure out which one, you know. I, we can apply what you're going to say to this area. Um, you know, some of the things I looked at back east, oh, God, I can't remember the name of that bush. The bush with all the yellow flowers. Is that a hydrania or a honeysuckle? I don't, I don't know. know. It's a honeysuckle. Not a honeysuckle, no. Maybe Somebody's the screaming at their radio right yeah, now. Yeah, they, they're there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and another one was Dame's Rocket, and I haven't seen that out here in California. It's just, it's a roadside weed, and it has, like, it comes, shoots straight up, and it has, like, little white flowers on it. Um, the area where I live, some of the flowers were, like, a purplishly, purplishy white, but you used to see those all along the creeks and stuff like that, and right around the time the sulfurs had started emerging. You know, okay. Um, so that my takeaway is just like, you see a hatch, look around you. Oh yeah. See or, what flowers are going. Note oh, it. Yeah. Write it down. In my case, you younger gen- gentlemen can and, and gals can probably just remember it. <laughs> I have to write it down. Probably <laughs> tattoo it. We'll fix oh, that soon. Well, I mean, there's a lot of little, um, like wildflower guides and stuff like that. Uh there is a uh, something that will go on your phone. I'm probably going to misremember it because I'm getting old. Um, It's like, uh, I think it's called like the... Is it the one that does a plant ID? Well, this is just, it's called the Guide to Common Weeds or something like that. But this gal we had working for me a couple of years ago, she was a really good botanist. You know, and uh, she basically had that on her phone and all the time because she said most... Most of the stuff you encounter are weeds, and you can learn how to identify most of the common things, you know, really pretty easily because you just look them up on your phone. Yeah, okay. You know? Yeah, I mean, there's one you take a picture, and it tells you what it is, Yeah. Which is cool. That would be neat, though, to start identifying stuff like that and, and correlate it to, like, a f- the fishing season on your local stream. Yeah. You know, like yeah, ladybugs. Awesome. Do you know much about ladybugs and the uh, way they hatch off? I know I know about how they overwinter, mm-hmm. uh, you know, up in certain places in the canyon. And they do that all over the place. Yeah. Guys um, locally talk about the ladybugs, like the ladybugs, you know. And yeah. And the ladybugs are out. You know, you want to get to the river because they're just sitting there kind of huh. waiting. Uh, yeah. And black ants, too. There's big, like, black ant hatch- hatches above us. Yep, flying ant hatch. That's a... Uh, and I, I've never 
heard of anybody nailing that as far as like timing it. But I know a guy. Yeah. I know a guy. <laughs> but um, uh, when they come off on the lake, it's you want to be there when it well, happens. I've been on a lake with no ant patterns. <laughs> you'll remember that basically yeah. sat there and watched fish feed all around me over and you over. didn't have a parachute atoms or anything like that i didn't have anything that imitated an ant yeah dude i've got the simplest black pat or black uh ant thing and it takes probably a minute your little glue gun your little glue yeah. gun no, you just basically the you know the black dumbbell eyes yeah that you'd put on whatever like a hex or whatever uh you just take that and then um black deer hair four strands and just whip it really quick with um just put all four pieces of hair right in the middle of the dumbbell whip it together really right. quick and as soon as you cinch it down the the deer hair just stands up like legs and you just tie it off it's done yeah and it well it obviously needs to go on a hook but it's uh super quick and it's deadly i think if you had anything in the right size you'd be per- you'd get a couple yeah. fish at yeah. least you know yeah that's a really quick way to time though and you can just get i just get like different dumbbell sized eyes and keep a few in my box at all times we got we got way off topic we were yeah. talking about the well, I, eggs I, larvae yeah I, did you okay, get your question answered or no so I, let's i'll bring it back to the caddis so um how do they make their their houses we talked about this before but you know i forget and oh, there, there's, there's there's we we're getting a lot of new listeners so they may not have listened to the episode where we talked about I said houses, but they're cases. Right. They're cases. Um, what's the binding agent that they, they use? Why did they select the rocks that they select? Where, you know, all that stuff. Okay. What they put them together with is silk. Um, caddisflies can spin silk just like, you know. Like a spider. Yeah. Well, actually, I think their silk is more similar to, like, the silk that, like, um, butterflies and moths spin. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, like, you're... you're classic Japanese silk is that comes from a, uh, a specific moth and uh, so when they build them it's basically just they I think it's just like a genetic set of instructions because there are some distinct there are some uh, some species that have distinctive qualities about their cases yeah. you can't really identify caddis flies based on their case alone but you can identify some like um like the october caddis the shape of their caddis is almost like you know a pup tent Mm -hmm. it's round on roundish on one side and flattish on one side you know um but you know the way they build them is they basically and i don't know why no one knows why they select certain sizes you know, again, I think it's just pre-programmed or That's what crazy. sizes or even specific materials. Like um, there's there's a, a pretty, fairly common caddisfly out here called Gumaga is the genus. It doesn't have a fisherman's name, but they really like like flat. Uh, it's not mica. It's the other thing that looks like gold. It's nice and shiny when you I've get their seen, cases. You I've know, seen that stuff. In fool's gold. Yeah, it, it looks like flakes. Iron it, pyrite? Is that, that what it is? That, I think that might be it. Okay. Um, But yeah, they they select pieces, and their, ca- their, their cases are very distinctive. You know, where, you know, like in the genus Lepidostoma, there's like a ton mm. of species, and they have all different kinds of cases, you know. And on top of that, sometimes they just steal a case from somebody else, <laughs> or they take or they take up residence in a case that's been abandoned for whatever reason. The the fly hatched, okay, so or you, fly if hatched, you, or the yeah. fly died, yeah. or. If mm-hmm. like you tear one, killed. like I've seen, um, I've seen Nick pull one out of a case before he puts it on his fly, um, and then occasionally they drop off and they go in the water. So it's not actually dead. Like yeah. it, it could literally just oh, yeah, go yeah. around, oh, yeah. find a new case, or even yes. build a new house. Yeah, um, I was just joking about him bait fishing. <laughs> by the way, I don't know. I've heard rumors. <laughs> <laughs> You can squeeze, uh, you squeeze in that juice and get, no, I'm yeah, just kidding. I, 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 li- I listened to that striper on the fly episode. I, I heard what you're talking about. 
Okay, I, I, so I was like, well, instead of squeezing the case and popping them out, I heard a better trick. You can just put them in a, a little bit of water and watch them crawl out. And yeah. It's not as really. Yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll crawl out. But um, I don't remember this guy's name. Uh, it's going back in the early 2000s. He was at uh, on University of North Texas. And he did a he did his master's degree where he was taking um, you know caddisflies out of their cases and examining the types of materials, and then taking them apart and leaving the materials in there, and then just you know filming how they put them back together again, <laughs> you know. And it was just like if they don't have a case, they build another case. They build a case and they just put it back together. And they, they just, just execute that program like yeah, you were talking about. Exactly. And this would be a cool guy to talk to. That and Hell yeah. Yeah. I can't remember his name. Like maybe there's you think like, about it, it's email. Um, email Sandberg me. should remember. Maybe there's a hidden okay. algorithm to the theory of everything in their cases and we just don't know about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I like it though. We can, there, there's some, oh, we're going to do a movie about that one, Joe. You in? <laughs> um, okay, so that's that's wild. Yeah. And and can the can the water go through the case? Is it permeable? I guess is yeah. the well, question. I don't know about the case itself. There is some give to cases. Some of them, mm-hmm. are, some of them are more flexible than others. Uh that's a good question. I don't know yeah. how much passes through and how much, you know, goes in and out. The other, you know, the ends, you know, um, in. In lakes, the cases are usually built not uh, is rarely built out of rocks. They're usually built like out of out of um, organic shit. Yeah, organic material, yeah. and that's because a lot of the a lot of the species that live in lakes actually swim around some. You know, like again the longhorns. You can they'll they'll be in amongst the weeds and they'll be swimming around. Is that like the motorboat caddis? No. The okay. motorboat is um. Yeah. <laughs> is uh, it's in the family Fragonidae, and yeah, they they build it's out of out of organic material, but they're about that big. The motorboat caddis, yeah, and that's like Im- the Goddard caddis. It's about is what two and a half Im- inches. Yeah. Imitates hand, that fly, right? The Goddard caddis. Or yeah, is, is um, mm. I've tried. Oh, I can't. There's um. There's a pattern from British Columbia. And again, I'm having a senior moment here. <laughs> it's basically, you know, imagine you know a fly built on a long hook, but you tie in a big, thick series of like elk hair caddis wings, mm-hmm. and it's meant to be cast out and then just stripped across. Oh the yeah, top. yeah, yeah. Uh huh. You know. Now, because trout eat the entire thing, right? Well, well th- at this point, you're talking about like th- um, the motorboat caddis, uh, the larvae. When it it'll, it'll pup, the larvae will build a preparium underwater, in it, and then it um, it pupates. But when the adults come up, you know, the the pupa come to the bottom, and it's crazy because they hit the surface. And you can see them splitting and they pop out. And as soon as they land on the top, because they're covered with those hydrobolic hairs, they take off running. What? <laughs> that would off. scare the shit out of me if I saw that on the lake They take or off running across the surface. I'd go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck is that? Manzanita Lake I'm is going. a popular lake where that was is supposed to come off. I've been there a bunch and never seen it. but I've seen it come off at Davis. Really? But... There was never a single fish came up. He ate eat on me. <laughs> um, Probably too much work, too much effort. I, I think there's just too much food in the lakes around here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, that's a real popular hatch up in British Columbia. But I think, I think the lakes down here just have so Start much more of everything in it. They're stuffed. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's you know? burgers laying around. Why are you going to go chase a elk down the road? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So yeah. if the if the caddis the caddis has to eat enough, it has to get big enough, and then the temperature has to be locked in for a certain period of time for that change to take place, right? That's kind of where we left off. For yeah, a bit. I got yeah, one more question much. about oh. the house building, really quick. Oh, okay, go How ahead. How long okay. does it take 
I don't know. Okay. Um, it's probably different for every single one. Yeah. And probably, like, uh, there's probably a lot of variables, like uh, how much building material is available. Material can find, right? yeah. All that, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. There's one more kind that you, ha that you have out here that they don't build a case at all. Um, it's a heteroplectron californicum. It's predatory. And... It will take like an old waterlogged twig and it bores through it Whoa. and makes a case out of that. It will also I've seen I've seen sticks, I've seen, hollow sticks. Right. And I've always wondered what the hell's going on there. Yeah. Okay. And and little pieces like three two to three inches yeah. with just a bored out middle. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. And interesting. They also they're pred they're predaceous, so they'll also kill another caddis fly, eat it, and take its case, and live in its case. Damn, it's bitching. It's ruthless. <laughs> okay, well, it's like a metamorphosis. The, yeah, the change so, from like, so you want to talk about pupation? Yeah, because then uh, I'm gonna s switch this to some. You know why why are cinnamon caddis or the cinnamon pupas? you know, so prevalent up in the Sacramento River up in Redding. And then we have okay. on the feather, you know, green. So we're, that's where I'll take it. We'll okay. From there. Um, so pupation, you were talking earlier about when they, um, they grow their wings and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually, it's a lot more radical than that. Um, you know, unlike, you know, mayflies and stoneflies where the adult is basically larva with wings what happens in the puparium is basically the larva is basically completely taken apart so all of its structures are taken apart um, its sclerites get shoved to the bottom of the puparium okay hold on back up a second what's a puparium and what are sclerites okay the puparium is basically so you have a you have a, a case. Okay. Well, we'll just take October caddis for instance. Um, when you pick up an October caddis and you there is an opening on the end, mm -hmm. and you can pull the larvae out. Yeah. It's a larvae. When you pick up one of those cases and it's closed at both ends, mm -hmm. that that one that individual has started pupation. Okay. So that's could, called a puparium. Yes. Okay. And you could break that open. And you could see a larva in there. Okay. Or you could see a larva that's basically swelling and losing its shape. And the sclerites are the hard parts on the outside. The rocks? No, the sclerites are the hard parts on the uh, outside of, of the inside. Of the poop. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, like the body. It's, it's almost like the exoskeleton starting yeah. to get hard. No, um, just the opposite. Dissolve. Dissolve. So okay. imagine like, you know, you have... You have the um, the larva, the head. Why they're different colors and they're hard is they're covered with these plates called sclerites, which is a different kind of material on the outside. Some of the some of the material on the outside is like a soft plastic, mm -hmm. so that it moves. Mm -hmm. Some is like a hard plastic, so it's rigid. Mm -hmm. You have to remember they don't have a skeleton inside, so everything that's all their muscles and everything are attached to the outside. So when they go into the puparium, basically the entire structure of the animal basically pretty much dissolves. It takes itself apart. That is so crazy. You ever pick one up and open it up and there's nothing but mush in there? Yeah. That's between that's in the step between when it was a larvae and when it reorganizes to become a pupa. Holy shit. So what happens and I don't know that it's really completely understood how any of that works. Um, when I was still in graduate school, one of my professors, she was working on how, how pupation works in tobacco hornworms. But I, I don't know, you know, that particular is, is physiological science, and I, I, that's not my field. But, but they, like, turn to goo at some point yeah, almost they, and then reconstitute. <laughs> right. They basically <laughs> to put it in layman's terms. Yeah, they turn right? to goo and then basically... You know, the pupa is built onto that. 
and the adult is actually inside the pupa. Wow. Okay, so when they when they go to emerge, they have a special set of mandibles on the front that's made for cutting themselves out of the puparium. So through that silk and all that other stuff. Well, basically imagine like they it's would like an egg tooth almost for in a chicken. It's, or like a yeah, it does the same function, but yeah. it's like a pair of scissors. They they snip out like that piece that they yeah. glued in on the top, and then they come out. That's wild. So the pupa is modified, so it uh the its legs. Uh, its legs are shaped like paddles and it'll have a lot of hair so it can swim pretty quickly and as it's swimming it's metabolizing gases and that's what gives them their shiny color because hmm. the gas builds up underneath the pupil skin and that actually helps them to rise too hmm. so you're basically swimming imagine if you were like stuck in a garbage bag and it was sealed and you had to get to the surface not only as you're swimming like you have two arms yeah but as you're breathing you're expanding the bag yeah everybody i've put in the garbage bags and sunk they stay down though <laughs> um that's crazy that so, is nuts that's super trippy right and depending upon what you're talking about like which which species or even in which genera some of the pupa hang it hang out down on the bottom for quite a while like hydropsyche some species will drift like 100 yards 200 yards on the bottom before they even try to swim up to the top you know um where others they just emerge and they swim right up to the top um ralph cutter have you seen that Bugs in the Underworld? Mm -mm. He has he, he put them out as a DVD a couple of years ago. It's and he and his that wife sounds familiar. He and his wife di did a lot of filming, and there's a lot of really short snippets. But if you want to see what a lot of this stuff looks like, you should try and get a, get a look at that. Hmm. He has he has a short little film clip of a pupa in a lake coming up through and you can see the silver bubble as it's swimming and rising. It looks like it's coated in mercury. I wonder if you, if these scientists have ever tried to take like clear glass or some kind of plastic and, and had them build this case out of this material so they could actually film and videotape that transformation with, with ins inside of it. You know what I mean? Cause you're saying that it's not really well known on how that process even works. And well, I, I think what people are more, because people have dissected them uh -huh. for a long, long time. Right. Like I think what there really is is how it works. Right. Genetically. The chemically. Chemi the chemically. Chemically yeah. and yeah. enzymatically. I mean, right. it, if you think about it, it's like astounding. Yeah. Yeah, no, that definitely. That that happens. You know? Um, so basically, then you have the pupa, and we go back to where we started, where I was talking about the adults. The pupa comes to the surface one way or another mm -hmm. and emerges mm -hmm. that's kind of standard right. um there are some that i've seen pupa swimming underneath the surface i've seen motorboat caddis pupa on the surface once right underneath the surface and the only reason i noticed it was i was sitting in the middle of lake davis and this was 14 years ago right at last light and I could see something swimming right underneath the surface and I'm like because I didn't I'd never seen motorboat caddis before um I tried vain in vain attempt in Colorado to like catch that hatch <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, never did but you know I saw this pupa swimming like right underneath the surface and it was freaky looking because it was huge and it looked like it. <laughs> at first I thought it was like a gigantic Crixid. I'm thinking about Tremors, you know? It's yeah. <laughs> a worms. great film. <laughs> and the worms, that's what it, it looks like a giant caddis now that you think about it. 
Um, yeah, it's, it's super cool to hear about all that stuff because you can apply it to the fishing, right? I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. all those different stages is one of the biggest trout or it could have been a steelhead that I caught in this valley. I was high sticking, uh, an, like a caddis, um, that I tie. It's, it looks, it's kind of like a, um, emerger. It looks like an emerger. It's got CDC. I always like putting CDC on my emerging caddis. It just has a trapping right. air and right. movement and. And I was high sticking it and I was swinging it up. So it was coming off the bottom and rising to the surface. Mm -hmm. And it just was like a little dit, 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 dit. and I set up and it ended up being, you know, one of the biggest uh, yeah. valley trout I've ever caught. And it was 20, 28 inches. It was massive. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of good anglers that they'll, when the evening comes, they spend a lot of time swinging flies just under the surface. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the caddis, they're hatching out all over the place. And then you want to fish it, you know, like an indicator, or a nymph down on the bottom. But he'll you know in particular this guy was swinging these emergers and just no weight nothing on there just swinging across frank hastings yeah and uh stick stuck like a six seven pound steelhead you know right underneath the surface yep. um it, it's just it's a really productive way to fish yeah i i used to high stick nymph with uh uh la fontaine sparkle pupa in colorado all the time and uh if you got yourself in the right spot in the river, it just slay them. <laughs> no indicator. Indicator just got in the way. I used to like the fish like that, that little shelf right as it dropped out of the riffle on the corner. Oh, yeah. And it's just like fish would just stack up in there, and you just high stick that, high stick the, a pair of pupa right into that little sweet spot. You'd take fish. I swear you'd catch one and th throw them back in, and it's another one comes up and takes his place. Because it was such a productive area. So in the in looking at like um, the redding area when the caddis are, and I say coming off, the caddis are coming off in the evening. Are they really coming off or did they come off earlier in the day, hang out in the bushes, and now they're coming back and, and laying their eggs okay, in the close. evening? Or are they coming off off the bottom in the evening? And uh, They're probably mostly coming back to overposit in right. the evening. So right. when are they um, actually emerging then? Like what time of the day? It depends on what you're talking about, which species you're talking about. But a lot of them are coming off during the day. Throughout the daytime. Like um, That's why you'll go to the bushes and you'll shake them and then all those caddis will fly around, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, in like, the afternoon. Like, like take something like brachycentris, which is um, the spring caddis or the granums. Um, during the day, the pupa are coming off all day long uh so like again most a lot of my experiences with caddis were from colorado to high stick nymph and stuff like that i used to fish like the mother's day caddis and you'd basically you'd fish pupa or you'd fish a drowned adult pattern all day long and then later on in the day you'd see you'd start to see the caddis coming back and you know you could switch to an adult then if you felt like it but um i've always liked fishing wet flies swinging wet flies and stuff like mm -hmm. that uh you know again you know there's so many species it's hard to just generalize right right you know and there's and there isn't just hydropsyche in the valley streams there's a lot of glossosoma and that's the little, the little one that has the cases that are shaped like tur turtles mm, that mm -hmm. you'll see on rocks. Those are glossosomatids, and you you have quite a few of those out here in the valley rivers. And then there's a, like surprisingly a lot of stuff that's in the frog frog water that is actually kind of still water stuff, like the, the black longhorns that are in in the lakes are. They're in the frog water. Because hmm. uh, caddis typically want to be up in the oxygenated... Well, in. well, they're adapted to like more still waters. And, the, you know, in the froggier sections of like, say, the feather, mm -hmm. you have a lot of immersion vegetation and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Some of those real slow areas, you're going to get more more attuned to like that kind of habitat. I think know? I remember talking to you one time. We used to sit on the feather and some riffles in, in the evening and swing flies around. And you just could sit there and have your line dangling yeah. down below you 
and the fish would come up and just and eat it. You'd be yeah. standing in real fast water, you know, and just oh, yeah. having just dangling, just hanging. It's you're not really casting or doing Can much, I, but you're hanging it down. And the fish and we caught a lot of big steelhead doing that. Yeah. Can I ask you guys a personal question? <laughs> you have to answer honestly. Have you ever eaten a caddis? No, stonefly. No, I've never eaten a caddis. I have eaten stonefly too. Yeah. What do they taste like? Grass. Nothing. Oh, what, what did Yours you? Yours taste like grass. Yeah. What did you? I eat? went. To, we were on the Deschutes and we were fishing. The Goldens were coming off. Terranarses were coming off, and um, yeah, we grabbed them. I ate them both, and they taste like taste like grass. Like chicken. You should have said chicken. <laughs> well. Mine were, mine were cooked in hamburger fat, so. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, you cooked them? <laughs> uh, I, uh, it was a training when I was working for USGS, and uh, we caught a bunch, and, you know, that was always the big dare. And we cooked them in hamburger fat, and we ate, like, some of the perlids, which would be, like, golden stones and stuff. But, um, you know, my boss told me, never eat, don't ever eat the the salmon flies because they they feed on algae and uh, oh you can get sick maybe yeah. that's why it tasted like grass yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't <laughs> shit right for a week i bet <laughs> no i just I, I kept catching fish you know it was fun Sweet, <laughs> how Power much did you it. have to drink <laughs> <laughs> nothing probably nothing yet I do you need a beer <laughs> well let's talk flies before we wrap up we're, we're I think we're a little over an hour right now, and I want to. Okay. I, wa- I do want to get to the flies, okay? Because uh, there's there's quite a obviously um, based on the life cycles going to affect your the fly selection. So can you guys kind of talk about the the fly selection a bit, like hook sizes, all that uh, common colors, um, not only for California, but I think anywhere in the Western U.S. or anywhere where someone can find caddis. <laughs> Is that all? I know, right? <laughs> it's easy. Right off the bat, I think of. Uh, tan caddis pupas just being you know anything tan like that it rips it, yeah even on lakes green, so too. on lakes and 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 uh rivers like the redding up in redding on the sacramento river and having those in different sizes so fox's pupa it's pupa licious right mm-hmm. that's a tim, great we did a tim fox episode we one, talk about yeah. that fly a lot one of the best fly i'll fish two of the same fl- two bead headed pupas at, at, during a, a hatch in the evening i've seen it yep yeah and it different well. sizes though right you, you kind of like taper the size down a bird's right nest, brown bird's nest, is also imitating that same tan mm-hmm. pupa, right? Um, and then, it, you could, is a is a prince nymph kind of that, but an attractor or no? I think of it more of an attractor, okay, pattern. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, a prince nymph is kind of shiny. Yeah, mm-hmm. peacock curl has a natural shine to it. Yeah, but I've seen peacock curl used for, you know, case I mean, caddis. Well, I mean, for a midge pupa, there's something called a hurl midge, which is basically all peacock hurl. It's just the abdomen stripped and the mm-hmm. thorax is just tied in. And I think mm. it's because it has a little bit of shimmer. I remember at one point when a lot of these flies were developed, they didn't have any synthetics at all. Right. right. You know, which synthetics that we can take advantage of, most of them didn't even exist until like after World War One, more so after World War Two. And people have been fly fishing for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I used to have some, like, really, really old French tinsel that was made out of metal. <laughs> and this stuff was all tarnished and nasty, but it was, like, it was, about, it was about 100 years old. Jeez. You know, and that's what it was made out of. Is back in the day, it wasn't mylar. It was made out of metal, which helped it sink a little bit. I think the fun thing too is all these old flies that you're talking about. You can take some of these new synthetics and apply them to some of these old flies oh. and and com- combo them up. You know, like like the pupa, for example, like fox's pupa, taking mm-hmm. bird's nest dubbing and tying it like yeah. a little bit like a bird's nest. You mm-hmm. know, just yeah. to give it some kind of a different look to it. Yeah, I mean, uh, another thing I've always liked to do is uh, one thing you would really do do yourself a favor as far as becoming a fly tire is go out and buy a little Krupp's uh, coffee grinder. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't have to be Krupp's. To but blend. That's what I have. To blend materials. Take, yeah, we'll take, you know, if you've got a couple different materials that you like, just start blending them mm-hmm. together. And I, I started out doing it by hand. You don't have to. You can 
mush it together by hand. But if you look at a lot of the really, really old popular dubbings, like back in the 80s, they were all made out of like, um, uh, I can't remember. <laughs> Anyway. But just like different ratios but, but, of but, colors, right, right? But there was a lot of different colors inside them. Right. So that, you know, when you have a lot of different colors mixed together, mm. you get, um, it's it's a more natural look. Right. Than just like, right. just like if, if you want to just go for silhouette, yeah, you can use just straight up black. Mm -hmm. But... Um, when you're talking about making blends, you know, and blending your different dubbings, mm -hmm. we've talked to different people on the show that, that mentioned that, you know, what color should you, what color fly should you fish? What color leech or what color bug? And a lot, some of them have said, well, what's the bottom of the lake look like? Right. What's, what's, what's your, your river look like? And, right. And those bugs will kind of naturally, is that true? Do that? Yeah. Most of them do that? Yeah. And, and I think it also has to do with just like, you know, in situ, like when you're when your your fly is floating through something where there's a lot of green, green light is going to be emphasized, right? Because because trout can see color. Mm -hmm. Um. Long time ago, Gary Lafontaine wrote a book called *A Dry Fly*, and um, he has a theory of color in there, and. It's a good book to read just for that, but the, if you've never, never read that book, you should go you do yourself a favor and go read that book. There's so much information packed into that one book. Um, is but, he the guy that would, sorry to interrupt, was he the guy that would tie all the flies together? He's the guy. And, that, swing, and swing like five different yeah, bugs at yeah, the one time? Yeah. yeah, Gary was, he also wrote Caddis Flies, which to answer your question where you wanted to he wanted to know all the all the possible combinations yeah and yeah that he did that that book it's in a book <laughs> all right all right joe, all right, joe. actually that, it is a good it is a good one yeah um he goes in depth about yeah. a lot of stuff gary lafontaine right is that what you said yeah yeah we were at the uh the old pal fly shop and we pulled his book out and it was signed. He had just recently passed. Yeah. And John or somebody pulled it out and realized that they had it. And the, but it was also signed. And none of them. They were like, wow, "Where did this come from? Like, we didn't, we didn't meet him. Like, we didn't have this thing signed. You well, know? And it, they had no you, idea. You could send a book to him and he'd sign it. He right. Did, he did it. He signed a book for me like did he? that one time. Did yeah. He? Oh, so he, it must have. Somebody must have done it and then just shut up out of nowhere. But I, it was kind of. It was just a little bit i only it? ever met him once but he was he was just a nice guy and he was just a fountain of, of uh knowledge right you know and he was so innovative there was a lot of his patterns that i use that are so weird they work great mm -hmm. but they're so weird nobody else will use them it looks like he's got two you're right he's got two books it looks he, like on amazon that i can see there's the dry fly new angles. Yes, that's one of them. And then he's got one called Caddis Flies. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. And he's written a couple other books. Okay. Um, you know, anything that he's written is wor well worth reading and well worth paying very close attention to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, he, trout flies po proven patterns. He's got also. Yeah, he was a, he okay, was a scientist. Cool. He was a behavioral psychologist. <laughs> oh wow. So. Man, the challenge of trout. He's got another one. Okay. And then as far as like the, stud. the adult caddis, I, I like stimulators and like a 16 small stimulators because they're really buoyant and they float well. Yeah. Um, is a good one. X caddis has been a real popular fly in the past for just a smaller silhouette type adult. X caddis is a fly? Yep. Yep. And the EC ca X caddis is one that has a hackle that around the base yeah. and that's a more of a fast water type type pattern. I, I like the EC caddis you like, you like a lot. The that's, EC one? That's, that's uh, Ralph Cutter's pattern. Mm -hmm. It's really good. It's and always been a good producer. What size is like 10, 12, 14, 16? No, 18, no, 20. more like four, uh, 14s and 16s. Yeah. Okay. The caddis can be really, can be more small. And how okay. does it work? Uh, remind I, me again. The nymph is like a 12. The caddis, the adult is a uh, 14. Goes smaller, right? Yeah, usually like I would go one size smaller. But yeah. You know, if, I mean, I don't like to imitate specific things because... I prefer to have flies that like cover a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like for caddisfly adults, 
I'm pretty boring. I like the EC caddis and I like the Oak Hair caddis. And I tie them, like you said, in 14 and 16 in olive and in tan. And I cover most of your del- mm-hmm. most of your situations on dry fly fishing. There you go. Um, I've found at least mine. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, you know everybody. If you if you have your own favorite pattern, stick with it. It's mm-hmm. sometimes with flies. I think it's more important to have confidence in your mm-hmm. in the in your pattern than you know. Yeah, I think that just applies to life in general. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's yeah. funny you brought up Antron because I I started tying some flies with Antron recently, and mm-hmm. um, it's that's a fishy material. I mean, it yeah. works. I I I tied this thing as a dry merger, and I've been nymphing with it, and it's the fi- it's catching trout up there in Redding really right. well. Um, and then if you want to fish it as a dry for those slurp- slurpers, um, it, you can't really see it, so you take your um, stimulator and like a size right. 14, 16, have that in the front and then you tie what right. in the smaller fly you can't see in the back. That way, if yeah. you see a fish roll, you know, behind near your fly, you can, you yeah. Can how catch far it. back do you drop yours? Cause I've had mine as close as a foot. Really? And it I, still works. Really? I yeah. try to go long. I try to do it almost three feet sometimes. I've, I've found like one foot away huh. and a lot of times they'll select the emerger or, or something like Interesting. that. Interesting. Like, you know, bluing the olives, I, uh, I like to fish like, uh, you know, a parachute atoms in the, you know, in the appropriate size, but I could see it. Well, I used to be able to see it, <laughs> but you know, like a foot behind, I would fish something like, um, like a Gary Borger's floating nymph uh-huh. and you know, you could see your fly and when you see a rise right next to your fly, just set. Well. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, when um, um go ahead. Oh, I'm gonna finish I, your I was, thought there. No, I was done. Okay, um, when you're when you're fishing fly two flies or more in line, um, do you go you tie into the eye or do you tie off the shank on your second one? This has been the hot topic lately. Super hot topic here. I've done both. What do you prefer? What are you rocking right now? Uh, I tend to not fish two flies. I haven't really fished two flies now in yeah, a couple of years. I don't either, really. I um, don't know. The only time I, I fish two flies is when I'm nymphing, and I don't really... I haven't really gone nymph fishing other than out of, like, Frank's boat mm-hmm. for years now. I just... I had, a, you know, it was one of those things where it's like I learned how to do it, then I learned how to do it well, and now it bores me to tears. Yeah. And I'd kind of rather go someplace and walk around and try to catch something on a dry fly. Yeah. Mm. That's, you know, that's the golden ticket. So what's know. cool about Horse, the sport, you can yeah. pretty much make it however you want. Yeah. You know? Some guys like streamers. Some guys like chasing bobbers. Are you yeah. still streamer fishing? Yeah. 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 I mean, I kind of mixed it up yesterday on the lower <laughs> sack. But I did throw the streamer. You did. For half the I, day. Yep. Didn't in a place a in a place that fish usually just eat nymphs, but that's that's yeah. cool. You have no. to try. Yeah, yeah. They do eat streamers. We, we oh. know they do if they're tossed correctly. I'm sure I, <laughs> stripped appropriately. I prefer fishing streamers over fishing nymphs. It's fun, dude. Yeah, I like it. Have you ever actually have you ever fished a streamer during a heavy hatch? No. During a heavy hatch. Try it, huh? During a heavy hatch, put on like a really little muddler. If there's fish rising, just cast it straight just across stream. on a floating line. I, I use, always use a sinking line. Okay, okay. Because you, you probably put the fish down, but I, used to, I always yeah. carry a Type Three. Okay. And just I'll try that. Cast straight across They're, and then strip. I just strip, bought these right these little them. black leeches that are like I don't know an inch and a half long, and they just look dirty. They've got a kind of a bigger head on them, mm-hmm. and then so they've got like a half an inch of of almost it's not hackle, but it kind of looks like hackle. It's softer material, so it kind of goes down. Mm-hmm. But when it's in the water, it looks exactly like a little black sperm. So it's got this this cool head, and then it just the action on it's good. It's got a little tiny sliver of flash down the side. I like that little flash. It looks good. Yeah. Makes Filthy. it look good. Yeah, it's gonna rip. It didn't yesterday, but I know it will. Especially oh. on lakes, I think. It's I was gonna, gonna put in a quick tag if somebody wants to see my little Antron uh, secret caddis fly for the evening. Uh, direct message me on uh, Instagram Ooh. or Facebook, and I'll I'll share it with you. 
Damn, Nick. I know. I might want to get some, out. Giving out some one. secrets. <laughs> um, or we're good then, yeah. Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, Joe. We've got the caddis. Covered. As always, I learned I learned a bunch having just listening to. We need to have beer more often and and just and talk fishing. Yeah. For shizzle. Um, if you guys like this show, rate us on uh, iTunes or wherever else you you get your your podcasts. Uh, please leave a, us a rating. It does help us out with with getting more subscribers, and um, that's what actually keep the fuel that fires this show. So please uh, rate us, share the show with your friends, um, get on there, rate us right now. Just put, just pull over on the side of the freeway, let the cars go by, enjoy the air, roll down the window, just rate us. They're probably already pulled over because your it's voice true. is so monotone today. They're probably they're crashed. They're asleep. <laughs> I know. I, 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 my blood sugar give, is a little low. That's give you a, give you a coffee. Okay, next so uh, rigs.barbless.co. If you go there, you can download um, and learn about all kinds of different uh, leader formulas uh, to tie your own leader formula, so that you don't maybe you don't have to buy tapered leaders, or if you're trying to figure out like you know a nymph rig to fish on the lower sack, go check it out. Rigs.barbless.co. Um, our flows beta, the app, the uh, the thing that gives uh, all the different CFS around the U.S. Uh, is all open for the Western U.S. We're still doing the open beta. Um, you can get a um, there's there's a couple ways you can get on the the beta. Um, the easiest way is if you're on if you're following us on Instagram, go to our profile. Um, there's a link down in, in the profile there that looks kind of cryptic. Tap on that. That's going to take you right in the install for iOS. We got Android coming. It's going to be here um, possibly by the time this er- this episode airs. Um, what else? Uh, apparel. Do you want to talk about apparel? I'll talk about apparel. Then. Uh, we got hats. We, we've had hats for a bit. We're, we're working on the website still. Uh, we got a lot of irons in the fire, guys. Things are kind of a little slower than, than we expected. But we have hats that are a, a second order coming in because we've already got halfway through our first one um, just giving stuff out. But um, that's going to be up uh, soon. Just bear with us. And um, as always, message us on, on uh, Instagram or um, if on our website. If you go to the bottom, there's a little chat window there, and we're usually pretty good about getting back to you guys. And also, oh, the, uh, the podcast discussion group. We have a closed group there. If you go uh, to Facebook and just search for the uh, pod, uh, the Barbos Podcast dis- discussion group, you'll see it there. If you go to our Facebook page, you'll see a link to it. You can um, apply there. We'll let you in. We the only reason we have the application is to make sure there's no spammers. That is all. No, one more thing. So before we started this show, I was asking you, Joe, what what you were working on, and you were doing some uh, water samples on, oh, yeah. on a certain stream. And uh, it's it's not a negative way to end the show, but um, something that w- we need to be careful of. If you travel a lot and you fish a lot of different rivers, you should definitely be mindful of your gear and, and cleaning it before you go into a different waterway. Why is that? Well, Joe, right. You were working on a uh, stream well, where so you don't spread New Zealand mud snails and, you know, a couple other noxious critters from outside of the, the area. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, let me look it up. I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, one of the one of the guys, a friend of mine, he's from down in Los Angeles. He works with the citizen monitoring groups, and he put together an actual um, a film, like a video online that you can access through the. I think it's on the Waterboards website that shows you how to um, decontaminate your gear. Oh, okay. Um, we can put that in our show notes for sure. Yeah, um, it's. That's the it's the protocol our our labs use. Mm-hmm. Like if some, if you know if we send a crew out and they right. find New Zealand mud snails, they decontaminate their gear. We've talked afterwards. talked about using bleach, but that's pretty harsh. We've talked about freezing yeah. your stuff. You know, if you've got access to a big freezer, throwing it in yeah. there. Um, yeah, no, that'd be good. That'd be really good to share with people. Yeah. So um, shoot me an email okay. and remind me. And okay. I'll, I'll track down Eric and see if uh. If that's still up and where it's at, where it's housed. Cool. Well, thanks again, man. Uh, we learned a ton, and we always appreciate your time. So thanks for coming in and, and chatting with us. Sure. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Fish on.